Hey, Kindred, it's Pastor Philip. I'm coming to you from the studio uh, in the church offices. And uh, yesterday, our nation uh, witnessed the inauguration of the 46th president of the United States, Joe Biden. And I want to bring a kind of pastoral perspective uh, to that event. Uh, what should be your response and my response? And I want to base around my, my remarks on 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 8, because Paul in these verses tells us to pray for kings and all who are in authority, that we may live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So here's our response. First, pray. First, pray. It reminds me of a, a story that comes out of American history where a famous a pastor by the name of Edward Everett Hill was asked um, if he prayed for the senators up on Capitol Hill. And he humorous, humorously replied, no, I looked at the senators and I prayed for the nation. And to be quite honest about it, I can feel his frustration. Um, just looking out on uh, our nation, what's been happening and what I assume will happen with a Biden administration, it's hard to pray. It's hard to know what to pray for. It's hard to pray for the success of an administration that we believe will multiply abortion, that seems to be held hostage by the radical left, that's going to open our borders, decriminalize illegal immigration, uh, will continue to demonize our law enforcement agencies, will use, you know, identity politics to divide us. I could go on. Uh, I think you're thinking what I'm thinking. So, so you know, how do you pray? Uh, what do you pray? That's been on my mind because I hear Paul's injunction here to pray for those in authority. And so as I, as I kind of combed through these verses, I think I was encouraged and, and I was uh, refocused by the word of God. And I hope this will be a blessing to you uh, as I address this issue of, of first pray. And as I looked at these verses, a few things jumped out that feed my prayer life and, and the focus of my, my intercession before God, both for our president and, and for our nation and for the church. If you look at these verses, um, 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 8, the first thing I'm called to do is pray for repentance. And, and that is especially pray for the repentance of our president, pray for the salvation of those in authority. There's many things we can pray for them and should pray for them. That certainly wisdom would be given, uh, that their policies would bring prosperity to the nation, that law and order would be upheld. Uh, those are the things that the Bible would inform us to pray. And, and if you read church history, um, the church has prayed for those in authority along those lines. Uh, in fact, I find a quote by, by Tertullian, one of the church fathers. Here's what he said. This is late second century, third century. He's dealing with the Roman Empire. In fact, when Paul writes this, he's dealing with Nero, uh, who was certainly no paragon of virtue, was, was ultimately one who would persecute and hurt the church and take the life uh, of the apostle Paul. But Tertullian uh, says this, without ceasing for all our emperors, we offer prayer. We pray for long pr life prolonged, for security to the empire, for protection to the imperial house, for brave armies, a, a faithful senate, a virtuous people, the world at rest, whatever as man or Caesar an emperor would wish. These things I cannot ask from any but the God from whom I know shall obtain, I shall obtain them, both because he alone bestows them, and because I have claims upon him for their gift, as being a servant of his, rendering homage to him alone. And so we can pray in that general sense uh, that indeed that perhaps the damage would be limited, uh, that, that uh, the breadth of the policies um, might bring a measure of stability and health to our nation. But, but, but given my doubts about that, uh, I'm glad to see that within this passage, the real focus is praying for salvation uh, for those in authority. Because when you read um, verses 1 and 2 about uh, praying, uh, interceding, giving thanks uh, for all men and, and for kings and, pre, uh, kings and all those in authority, we read in verse 3, for this. That is that kind of praying 
for, for this um, is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Then we go on to read about the means of that salvation is the person and work of Jesus Christ, the only mediator between God and man, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due season. Paul says, and I have been appointed to preach that glorious gospel. So in the context, my prayer focus for those in authority who are outside of Christ is that they might come to know Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to encourage you, as I encourage myself, to pray for repentance. That our, that, uh, our President Joe Biden would come to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, faith alone in Christ alone, uh, through grace alone, that those in his administration, uh, those in our government, both Democrat and Republican, uh, those at the state level and the local level, that, that indeed uh, we might see uh, some of these influencers come to faith in Jesus Christ. And in a sense, we might say that's a bit of a tall order. Um, because Paul tells us in his letter to the Corinthians, you know, not many mighty, not many rich are called. Um, but, but he doesn't say not any. He just says not many. And you and I can pray for that. And, 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 and in my own mind, I was kind of going, okay, if this is what I pray for, I'm not sure we would see that. Well, when, when's the last time we, we saw a president come to faith in Jesus Christ in a public manner that perhaps had a ripple effect within the culture? But, but we should look for it. And you know what? Within history, we have seen it. I think about Daniel and, and Nebuchadnezzar. Um, getting outside the political realm. Think about Paul, who wrote this. How many Christians wrote him off? How many Christians saw him beyond the pale? How many Christians saw him beyond the reach of redemption? In fact, he tells us in his letter to Timothy here, that he's a pattern of God's long-suffering and the abundance of God's mercy. Uh, what about, um, you know what, uh, John Newton, who um, was a slave trader, a man of, of vile behavior, uh, immorality. He gets saved and he writes to him, we all love, amazing grace, I sweet the sign that saved a wretch like me. And you know what? John Newton said about his own conversion and his own experience of the lavish grace of God, he despaired of no man. He despaired of no man. Let's pray for our president. Um, uh, let's pray uh, for his success where it is good for the nation and the common good of society. But let's pray for his salvation and believe God that it's possible. In fact, when I was studying for this, I was challenged. And I think you'd be challenged by a quote by Christensen, one of the great church fathers and preachers who said, it's hard to hate a man when you're praying for him. That's true. It's hard to hate a man. When you're looking into the face of a, of a gracious and merciful God who has shown grace to you and ask God to forgive your debts but withhold them from someone else, Jesus taught us to pray that, that God would forgive our sins as we forgive others. Hard to hate a man when you're praying for him. It's a good word. So pray for repentance. Number two, pray for rest. Pray for rest. The rest of the church the peace of the church within society. Look at what Paul says here. Pray for kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Paul is praying for the prosperity of the empire. He's praying for the salvation of the emperor so that the church might know an element of peace, a measure of religious liberty and religious freedom so that the church, in expressing godliness and reverence, the church going about her business of doing all things to the glory of God might indeed be uh, 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 um, salt in the society and, and light in the culture. And, and so Paul prays for that and encourages us to pray for that. Uh, he doesn't rule out, I'm sure, because he talks about it elsewhere. Persecution can come our way. But Paul wants us to know that the persecution, it comes because of our good behavior, not our bad behavior. 
that the persecution comes as a result of our gospel commitment and our righteous living, not because of, of um, you know what, uh, civil uh, discord or, or unnecessary civil disobedience. And, and, and that's a challenge, isn't it? Uh, certainly, this idea of living a, a quiet and peaceable life isn't that we live some monastical experience off the grid. Paul's not telling us to go unnoticed. He wants us to live out our Christian life in the public square in a demonstrable manner, but he's wanting us to do it for gospel advancement, for gospel ends. And he's warning us not to be an unnecessary agitator, not to kind of poke the bear, so to speak, but to make sure that the ire that's coming our way is because of our commitment to the Christian gospel or a biblical worldview. In fact, as I studied church history, I was uh, challenged uh, once in finding out that there was a time in church history where, where kind of martyrdom was sought as a badge of honor. Um, certainly Jesus told us uh, to take up our cross, certainly within biblical, uh, the biblical record in church history, there is an expectation that, that at times in life the Christian will pay the ultimate price. Um, but, but there was a time when, when some um, thought that this was the most honorable life that was martyrdom and, and death for Christ. And they went seeking it. They agitated. They, they, they put themselves unnecessarily in harm's way. And Paul is kind of warning us not to do that. Uh, to live where possible a quiet and peaceable life, to live within the laws of the country as, as conscience and the biblical commands allow us and, and, you know, to make our first priority the advancement of the gospel, not a political cause, not national prosperity, although there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. The Jews were sent to Babylon and they were to seek the welfare of the city. But our first commitment is the church and our first passion is the gospel. And, and we need to pray for repentance on the part of leaders and, and those in authority who don't know Christ, that indeed God might raise up some more Theophiluses that can benefit the church. But let's pray for rest. Let's pray for repentance. And then finally, let's pray for re reformation. Let's pray for reformation. Um, if we scoot down to verse 8, Paul says, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. I find that challenging. Um, certainly the lifting up of holy hands could be speaking about a posture. But if you read the Bible, there's not one set way. You can, you can stand and pray. You can kneel and pray. You can lie prostrate and pray. You can stand and hold your hands up and pray. And, and certainly that probably is being addressed in some measure here. But, but holy hands um, is a call to clean, cleanliness of life holiness of behavior. It's interesting too, by the way, guys, this is a Greek word that specifically means man in distinction from women. This is a call to men to lead the charge in prayer, to lead their families in prayer, to lead the church in prayer, to stand up with, uh, uh, in the midst of the context of a life consecrated to Jesus Christ. And, and, and a life committed to holiness and godliness. Maybe the verse that threw your way would be Psalm 24. You know, who, who can climb the holy hill? Who can approach God? Who, who can go before him? Those who are of a clean heart and clean hands. And I think that's what's going on here. Later in his letter to Timothy, Paul will talk about, hey, you, you need to be um, a vessel clean and fit for the master's use. And here, here's the challenge I found as I was wrestling through the implications of the inauguration yesterday and what a Biden administration will look like and what we will face as the church and what we're up against or whatever. Pray for repentance, pray for rest, but pray for reformation, not so much of the culture, but the church. Not so much of the culture, but the church. You know, I find myself, haven't you, falling into the trap. It's easy to curse the darkness. And it's easy to point out the gross moral sins of our culture. 
which are real and damaging and damning. Don't get me wrong. But you know what? Peter says judgment begins at the house of God. Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus' last words to the church. Five churches out of seven, repent of your lovelessness. Repent of your theological compromise. Repent of your traditions and, 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 and replaying your, your, your walk with God instead of breaking some fresh ground and attempting some new thing. Repent of your lukewarmness. Maybe it's time to step back and, and, and take a look at ourselves. We've been taking a lot of time looking at the culture. Let's look at ourselves. Let's go before God with holy hands. Let's repent of, of our sin. Let's dedicate ourselves afresh to Jesus Christ. Let me finish with this. This is a quote uh, from Robert Murray McShane, the great Scottish pastor. He was writing in 1840 to a friend of his called Dan Edwards, who was intending to do some missionary work among the Jewish people. And, and he was preparing himself in Germany for that work. And, and, and McShean wrote this, I trust you will have a pleasant and profitable time in Germany. I know you will apply hard to German. But do not forget the culture of the inner man. I mean of the heart. How diligently the cavalry officer keeps his saber clean and sharp. Every stain he rubs off with the greatest care. Remember you are God's sword, his instrument, a trust, a chosen vessel unto him to bear his name. In great measure, according to the purity and perfections of the instrument, will be the success. It is not great talents God blesses, so much as great likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. That little phrase jumped out at me. Don't forget the culture of the inner man. We talk about culture wars and the real ideas have consequences and we shouldn't sleep on the changes in our culture. But as we pray for repentance regarding our leaders and pray for rest regarding the church, let's pray for reformation within the church and regarding my life and your life. Let's take care of the culture of the inner man. Is our attitudes right? Are we developing the fruit of the Spirit? Are we like Jesus in our evangelism or our apologetics or when we confront sin? Be careful about being drawn into the culture where it can make you angry. It can make you bitter. It, it, it can change the price tags on your life and you can forget the priority of advancing the gospel. Let's deal with the culture of the inner man. Let's lift up holy hands and pray for repentance, rest, reformation. Love you, kindred. God bless.